Hey everyone, this is Josh with another Bitcoin and blockchain tutorial available at chaintuts.com. And today I'm doing a code companion update. So in a previous tutorial, I introduced everyone to my project MicroBitAdder, which allows you to generate completely offline uh, private key and address pairs for uh, Bitcoin using these really nice Adafruit microcontrollers and various outputs and various sources of entropy and that sort of thing. And I really like this project. I got a lot of great feedback sharing this project online in various uh, forms. And I wanted to sort of add more features as a stretch goal because I really like this project. And there are actually four major cryptocurrencies that I like to study and use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I originally wrote this just to support Bitcoin uh, legacy addresses, and by default that also supports legacy addresses for Bitcoin Cash. But really, I use Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin all pretty frequently when I'm creating content and making payments for things in places that actually accept cryptocurrencies. And I thought it would be really great to extend this project to support all of those cryptocurrencies that I like to use and support. And in order to do so, I had to face a couple more interesting challenges along the way. This was a very challenging and interesting project in the first place. And you know there was more uh, changes and uh, understanding of cryptography and some different computer science concepts that I really needed to work through to add support uh, for additional currencies with this project. So the first thing that I did was I added support for Bitcoin Cash's Cash Adder address format. Shortly after the fork in 2017, a lot of users encountered issues getting uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash addresses confused. They are two completely different blockchains and completely different cryptocurrencies. So accidentally sending funds from a Bitcoin Cash wallet to say a Bitcoin address that uses the same format could cause loss of funds or at least a lot of headache for users uh, that were using both cryptocurrencies. And so uh, the Bitcoin Cash development team introduced a new specification, which is uh, a special encoding used for that chain only. And Cash Adder, thankfully, is already supported by the Trezor crypto libraries that I use as the basis for this project. So I took the cryptographic primitive you know, algorithm implementations from Trezor and imported them to run on the Adafruit platform on the, you know, the circuit Python extension that I was developing for this. And cash adder support was already available. So all I needed to do to create a cash adder address was add a different version prefix to the uh, public key hash before encoding it using their function. And with Trezor, it thankfully already takes care of the checksum that goes at the end of the address that helps wallets and users make sure that when they type in an address, it's actually a valid address. The next thing that I added support for was Litecoin. So Litecoin is sort of in a lot of ways like a little sister to Bitcoin. Uh, they share a code base and a sort of a shared history uh, and the developers often interact with each other to add support for new features. For example, segregated witness when that came out. And it turns out that Litecoin addresses are really generated and encoded the same way that Bitcoin addresses are. The only key difference is there is a different version specifier or version prefix at the beginning of the public key hash before it's encoded. So instead of using what Bitcoin uses for a version prefix, I just had to use Litecoin's version prefixes when running through the algorithm used to generate an address. So that includes the address itself as well as the WIF wallet import format private key. Uh, both of those use a different version prefix than the ones used in Bitcoin. But other than that, it was fairly straightforward to do that. That was really the only difference. And on the API side, I had to add a way to specify that you wanted to generate a key pair for a different cryptocurrency. So in the UBit adder object that you, you know, construct on the Python side, you simply pass in an optional argument for currency that says, you know, UBit adder dot LTC to support Litecoin. Now the final cryptocurrency I added support for is Ethereum. And this was sort of the most challenging because Ethereum uses a little bit of a different cryptography and actually a different encoding format 
than Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, and uh, Bitcoin. So Ethereum to generate their addresses, rather than using SHA-256 and RipeMD to generate the public key hash, Ethereum uses one round of the Kekak SHA-3 hash. So Kekak is one of the proposed implementations of SHA-3 that was submitted to the NIST competition uh, that was open for invitation. The final SHA-3 NIST implementation is not Kekak. They're actually different algorithms. But again, fortunately, Trezor has our back. They're one of the you know, hardware wallets that's been out in the ecosystem for a while. And their crypto firmware uh, included support for Kekak. So in my code, I have the public key. And in Ethereum, you strip off the uncompressed uh, version identifier. So you take off the 04 at the beginning of the uh, uncompressed public key, you run that through a single round of Kekak uh, hash, and then you encode it. Now the encoding was another interesting challenge I didn't necessarily expect to run into. Ethereum just uses hex format. Hexadecimal is a very, very common format for representing binary data in computer science. It's a base 16 number. So it uses the character 0 through 9 and then A, B, C, D, E, F as the characters that represent the digits. So like base 10, what we use every day for math is the characters 0 through 9. Uh, base 16 adds on the A, A through F as part of that encoding. And this is something that's used really, really frequently in software engineering, computer science. But it was surprisingly challenging on a microcontroller platform because one of the easy standard ways to encode something, some raw byte data in hexadecimal, is to use C's sprintf function that's included in the standard library. Well, it turned out when I went to actually compile this code for the microcontroller to take my CircuitPython code and compile it down so it could run on the Grand Central and the Itsy Bitsy and the Metro, the sprintf function was actually not available. There wasn't an implementation for it, so the compiler couldn't find the function definition. So I had to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to do some hex encoding. And I went on Stack Overflow, I saw a few code snippets that I didn't really understand very clearly, but I saw a comment that said, you know, you can use bit shifting and uh, that sort of thing, bit shifting and um, bit masking to do hexadecimal encoding. So I ended up working on my whiteboard back here and figuring out a pretty clear way to do this. So uh, I'm actually going to move the camera over there and tell you a little bit about how you can do hex encoding without needing to use a standard library function. So when it comes to solving this problem of encoding something in hexadecimal without using a standard library function, there's actually a pretty ingenious little way to do this using some of the uh, binary operators that are available in most ma major programming languages, especially C and C++ because they're really low level. When you encode something in hexadecimal, you end up with two digits for one byte of information. So for example, uh, 05 in hexadecimal that represents one byte of data. So really, one byte has eight bits, and therefore you would split that byte into two chunks of four bits, and there's actually a funny little name for that called a nibble. So in order to work on one byte of information, which is the lowest amount of information that you can actually work with in a programming language like C, you have to use something called bit masking to get rid of information that you don't want to currently look at. So, for example, if we want to look at the rightmost four bits of a byte of information, and we don't care about the first four, you can use a bit mask, which is 00001111, to clear off the information that you don't care about. This is done using the binary AND operator. So, these four zeros here mask off the data that you don't care about looking at, by using a logical AND. So for each bit, you would go down the line, you have uh, one, which represents true, or any non-zero number really represents true in the context of something like C, but we're dealing with bits. So one is true and false. So true and false is false. False and false is also false. 
True and false is false. False and false is again false. Now with uh, the one, 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 one here in the second half of the byte, this actually just masks the data right through. So if you have true and true, well that's true. If you have false and true, well that's false, and so on and so forth. So you end up with a byte where you only have the last four bits of actual information. And so what that allows us to do here is we interpret this byte just as an integer. So this integer can serve as an index to the character set of hexadecimal numbers, or hexadecimal characters, rather. So for example, let's just say we end up with, well, what's this here? We have 1, 2, no 4, and an 8. So this is 10 in binary. So this nibble here, this second half of this, would be represented at index 10 in the character set. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 0, 1, 0 in bits actually represents A as a, as a hexadecimal character. Now this is a little bit trickier with the uh, leftmost part of the bit, or that nibble, because when you mask it off and you represent this as an integer, these four zeros at the end changes the place that this data is in. So this wouldn't work as an index. So your, your number here, you have 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's actually a much bigger number than fits into this you know, 16 character set. So what you do is you mask this information off, so you get rid of the last four bits, the last nibble of information, and then you actually use a technique called bit shifting. So you take these bits and shift them four to the left. And most implementations, so like in C, uh, the bits at the front that you moved over, they just get padded with zeros. So now, again, we have 1010 as the left index, and so you can get the character set and go from there. Now you have a hexadecimal uh, encoding for 1010 repeating as AA in hexadecimal. So that's how I solved that problem. This is just totally raw C. It will run on anything you can compile C for, and you don't have to rely on having a standard library implementation. So after dealing with that hexadecimal encoding problem, that was pretty much all I needed to do to add support for Ethereum. It took a little bit more work and a little bit more understanding of some lower level programming, computer science stuff, as well as you know, adding a new cryptographic algorithm that I needed to be aware of, which is you know, the Kekak SHA-3 implementation. But now uh, my offline address generator supports Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash with Cash Adder, uh, Litecoin and Ethereum. So it's possible now to hook up whatever hardware you want with the software that I have you know, on the Adafruit M4s and generate a cryptographically secure key pair completely without needing to use a, a full PC. And I think that's really interesting. I think that's a valuable project uh, for me because it really helped me understand more deeply you know, all of the cryptography that goes into this, some of the security concerns, and that sort of thing. So I wanted to wrap up just by saying and sort of adding, you know, just as you always should when dealing with something in cryptography, uh, this code is experimental and you should be careful with it. I am a security conscious software engineer. I care deeply about security and understanding cryptography and all those sorts of things as I'm in the cryptocurrency space but I'm not a cryptographer by trade. There are always sort of foot guns and pitfalls that you have to be aware of when dealing with cryptography code. So if you're gonna download this code on your own device and play around with it or use it, use it at your own risk. You wanna make sure that you actually understand the code and what's happening before you uh, put that trust in somebody else. Uh, also just be aware if you're interested in playing around with this sort of thing, you know, paper wallets, offline key pairs have been used for a long time in the cryptocurrency space. You know, as long as they're uh, securely generated using a proper amount of entropy, they are valid and secure key pairs to use. However, there are some pitfalls that you need to be aware of when you're using a single private key and address. Uh, compare that to using a mnemonic seed that generates, uh, generates a lot of addresses for you in a deterministic way. When you're dealing with a single key pair, uh, 
there's not really an easy encoding format. So if you're gonna use this with an LCD screen or a receipt printer or something like that, which I've been testing with, really make sure and be careful that you are writing down the private key correctly. Uh, with base 58 especially, you know, there's capital and lowercase versions of characters. Make sure you make a note of that and make it really clear for yourself if you're gonna use a raw key pair like this. Because if you get one bit of data wrong and you can't figure it out, your money is gone. You have to make sure that your private keys are not only secure from prying eyes, but also secure from your own sort of mistakes. Uh, as well, there are privacy concerns with address reuse that you know I'm not gonna go into. Uh, it's a little bit outside of the scope of this video, but just know that if you're gonna reuse address over and over, uh, you do run the risk of leaking some information about your other transactions using these cryptocurrencies. And finally, there are again some sort of foot guns with uh, actually using the funds for spending later. So if you use a single key pair like a paper wallet or something that you would generate with this project to store your funds long term, make sure that you only use that paper wallet once. Once you go to spend those funds and you import that private key, you must burn the old key and not use it again to store funds. The safest way of doing that is to use a wallet's sweep functionality, which is different from importing the private key. When you enter the private key with a sweep functionality, what the wallet will actually do is it'll take all of the funds on, uh, from the address that you generated and had on the offline wallet, and it will actually create a transaction and send it to a new address that the wallet controls. This is an important distinction from just importing the private key. Because especially with modern HD wallets, where you write down a you know, mnemonic seed, the private key that was on the separate paper wallet is not included in that mnemonic backup. So if you lose that wallet and you just imported the private key, those funds would be gone. The sweep functionality instead will send it to a completely new address that you control that is included in that the address set generated by that mnemonic seed. That also prevents another major pitfall, with, which is dealing with change addresses. So if you go to spend these funds uh, and you have the imported private key, you might think that if you only spend a chunk of it, that the rest stays in the address uh, of the paper wallet. However, with most wallets, that's not the case. It will create a new change address in the wallet to send the remainder of that those funds to and they won't actually be in the paper wallet. They'll be in your, your other wallet that you're using for spending online. So I don't wanna scare anyone. I just wanna make you aware of those pitfalls when you're dealing with offline wallets. It's really important, and you know, especially when we're talking about crypto education, that you understand what you're getting into. Don't just take my security advice for what it is. Don't just take anybody else's security advice what it is. Make sure you actually go into understanding the security arguments. Because the more you know, the more you're going to be able to keep yourself safe out there dealing in this sort of new uh, space that doesn't have, you know, some of the backups and, and regulatory safeguards that the banking industry has. So as always, I want to thank you very much for checking out this project and for listening to this tutorial.